What's up, what's up? Just realized I look like I work for State Farm or I should be a Target or something. Got my red Mickey Moon shirt on. And my uh, tan jeans. I'm ready to sell some insurance or some cornflakes. I'm gonna mess with another um, one of Jim Riley's Survival Guide for the Modern Drummer tracks. This is the second tune. Medium pop rock. <laughs> Similar vibe as yesterday, but a little bit more mellow. With the point being writing appropriate parts that serve the song elevate the dynamics where they need to not obliterate anything that's in the track that should be heard. I'm just listening. First time through just for a vibe. is some syncopation happening in the guitar part. The question is, do you accentuate that or support that with ghost notes or do you stay out of the way and let that rhythm guitar do its thing? That's a decision to be made. So what if I back it up a bit? It starts right here. That would be using the ghost notes to play with the guitar. What if I stay out of the way of it? So to me, this song, I haven't listened to the whole thing yet, is the mood is kind of stays very similar. So it's going to be more about adding textures versus getting louder and quieter all the time. I'm sure there'll be some dynamic changes, but like the ghost notes can be your texture shift for the B section, even though you might just stay grooving like this. So I want to go back to the beginning and actually chart this sucker out and see what we got. One, two. One, Assuming there'll be an intro, so... Three... Four, I guess the groove comes in right away. So that was four. And then the guitar melody starts. Four. And then that repeats. So I'm going to say the first four is the intro, and then when that guitar melody starts, I'm going to call that a verse. One, so two, counting along. One, two, three, intro, four, one. Why does it keep doing that? It's going to be hard for me to play to that one, if it keeps doing that. Two, one, two, three, four. Wow. Okay. So this is an intro just setting the vibe. And then here comes the verse. One, two, three, four. Repeats it basically. Two, three, four. Now what? Uh, maybe a pre chorus. 
plus a hold. Two, this is a course. Three, four, five. So they added some tambourine there. So it's obviously going up a little bit. Back to the intro. Or is it a verse? Let's see if the guitar part comes in. Yep. So that was another four bar intro. Verse, another verse. Three, four. Repeats it. Two, three. Should be the pre chorus coming now. Yep. Two, see if they have the hold again. Three, last time there's a hold right here. A build. Three plus a build. Chorus again. Four. Repeat. Two. Three. All right, now where's it gonna go? Four. Oh, a build. Bridge. Definitely ups the intensity, 16th and the tambourine. Four. Two. Three. Four. Another four. Solo. Which is over the first part. Two, three, four. Three chorus with three. Is it going to be a hold? Yep. Plus a hold. No, oh, this is like a breakdown. Four, three plus a build. Back into the chorus with the solo over top of it. Four. Slight change. Three. Four. Plus one. Aha. Back to the intro. Pretty simple form, just a couple things. The pre-chorus has a hold the first time, it has a build the second time, it has a hold the third time. There is a breakdown where the groove should stop, maybe just play hi-hat time. The last chorus, four bars are normal, and then there's a the chords change, four bars with an added fifth bar to kind of release back to the verse, or the intro. And that's it. So the dynamic shift is really the bridge. It gets louder there. And then the breakdown comes down. And that last chorus probably can lift through that extended five bar phrase. What's up, Jason? Yes, he does have PDF charts, but I'm I um I do my own cheat sheet here. It helps for me to notate this can the light is too bad on this, but um, I like to make my own sheets with dynamics and things that might not be in the supply chart. Um, okay, so let's just try recording it and see what happens. So we're gonna do one take through, trying to play basically the bare minimum, just to kind of feel what what maybe the song wants or doesn't want from me and then we can reassess. One, two, one, two, three, four.
All right. What do you think? Was that cool? All good? Should I try something different? Did it get a little bit too bombastic in the... Um, the bridge was cool. Maybe the solo should come back to the hi-hat. Maybe that last intro verse part should be back to the simple version. But I think overall, again, that could be a functional take to start with. And then we can build from it. We can add and subtract and that's where I like to get feedback from the artist or the writer or producer or whatever, whoever is having me play drums on their tune. I don't want to do too many takes and get too invested in the minutia of, of my parts before they can hear where I'm at with it. Yeah, I think the transition into the solo was cool. I'm just wondering if I shouldn't have stayed on the ride. I'm just gonna try it again from the top. This will be like take two. Let's just imagine I got some feedback. They said, yeah, bring the solo down back to the hi-hat, see how that sounds. Um, and the, the final intro outro part, go back to a simpler groove. So let's just see. One, two, one, two, three. <laughs> So I already know what what have done when you did not get that feedback. Um, I probably if if I got little direction, and they were just like just do three or four takes, and and I'll you know I'll work with it. I would probably do that. I would probably give a couple different versions of how to play the chorus, a couple different versions of how to play the bridge, and the so the parts where where it could go multiple ways dynamically. Um, I would just do those in, in subsequent takes, so then there's a possibility for using the bridge from take three and the rest from take one or something. I'm going to start the intro a little bit more intense and bring it down when that verse comes in. Might not be the right move, but it's what I'm going to try. One, two, one, two, three. <laughs>
Yeah, I don't know if I like that better or not, but it's different. It can start a conversation. Like, does that is that taking it where it needs to go or not? Um, I don't think so. I think I think once it's up, it needs to stay up. That's kind of how I'm hearing the dynamics in this thing. So the first, up until the bridge, I think it's all kind of chugging along moderate intensity. I think bridge, solo, final pre-chorus should have all stayed kind of up to make that breakdown a little bit more dramatic. And then that last chorus with the variation, the five bar variation, it's cool. I'm digging going, I'm kind of emphasizing that by changing from maybe the high up to the ride. I think that was cool. And then that last outro, I think I want to stay on the ride. So I'm gonna do one more take. Hopefully you're not bored yet. This will be my third final take. So I'm gonna try to keep this one first half mellow. Once we get to the bridge, keep it kind of up, bring it way down, and then keep the last chorus and the outro kind of up as well. Let's try that approach. One, two, one, two, three. sure about that intro I think maybe the intro I'm going too too hard too hard in the paint I'll try to keep the very intro in the first verse mellow one two one two three
something I just heard in the ending there that I should have caught in all three. Boom, doom, 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 the bass. Check it out. I should have caught that instead of blasting 16s. even like a slight retard on So if I had listened more carefully, I would have heard that and played that in all three takes. What's up, Frisco? How you doing? Good to see you back here a little bit later today. Um, yeah, so that would be a note to myself, like, punch in that so at least there's a clean ending that catches those I think overall maybe the first take was better it was best but there's options now um, with that punched in ending ding, 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 ding. slight retardando into that last B1 um, any other notes to myself Yeah, I think, I mean, maybe more a bigger fill going into the bridge to set that up more would be good. But like I said, this is what I would deliver whoever's hiring me if they're not in the room with me to be like, here's some options. Let me know if you need anything else while I've got the session open, you know, within the next hour or something. I can go back and hit. That actually happened to me last night. I was doing a song for a buddy of mine who's a producer, mixer. I wanted to replace a drum machine on a track. So I did a very basic recording for him. They gave it just a little bit more dynamics and, and variety, but it was still kind of adhering to the, the original kind of drum machine pattern. And then he got back to me very quickly said, hey, if the kit's still set up, do this for me, place you know, a bit more fills, a little bit more dynamic, going to the different sections. Doesn't need to sign like a drum machine. Boom, did three takes, sent him over. An hour later, he said, take three was perfect. Thanks for you know addressing all my notes. Checks in the mail. So all that happened, I gave him one basic take. Said, here, check this out. Let me know if it's the right sounds, what, the right vibe. And then any feedback and immediately said, yeah, give me some triplet fills going into these sections, the solo section, hit the piano riff in that the second chorus, and boom, done. I did three versions of that. Track's done. Delivered. Rather than taking the other approach, which would be trying to play a, a crap ton of fills and licks and hitting every accent, just trying to be super like complicated or excessive with the drum parts, then it's almost like, well, I don't know where to begin to tell you what to do. It's, it's too much, but I don't know what to tell you. I'd rather someone say, give me more versus, um, you know, just give me less. I think it's harder to, <laughs> it's harder to produce a drum track when it's overplayed versus when it's underplayed. Because when it's underplayed, you can hear what's missing. Like that last little thing there. I, I just finally heard it. Oh yeah, you're not catching that bass line. If I would have just been playing fills nonstop, it'd be hard to be like, yeah, can you just not play as many fills? I mean, <laughs> I don't know what to say. Um, so anyway, that's my approach. When doing sessions for people is to start with the least amount of drumming that I can do and then we can build from it versus going ham on the whole track. Um, what's up, Brian? Yeah, there we go. Glad you agree. Yeah, the, the uh, too busy is, is the worst feedback. Ah, it's just too busy because then it's like, oh, what do you mean by that? So yeah, I go for the tell me what more you want approach. 
So that's a pretty simple song. Literally never played it before, but I feel like I've got a, a good framework of a drum take to start from. So any questions anyone has, let me know. Otherwise, I think I'm going to like mess around with the tuning of these drums to see what I can get out of them. Because they are still, I mean, as low as they can possibly go. Hey, Brian, by the way, I checked out your uh, in-ear stream the other day. Definitely some good ideas I need to, I need to address some of that. I do use a mixer. And I send a, um, I have a um, SM57 I put on the ground. That's how I get the horns and guitar into my mix. I don't have to worry about the, the house engineer doing a sub mix with three horns and guitars. I just use that mic to a separate channel and I blend that in so I can, I can kind of control the stage sound in my ears. Then I just have front of house put keys and the main vocals in my in ears and that's it. Too much stuff in my inner mix gets very confusing because we've got a click track, we've got electric piano, we've got electric guitar, two lead vocalists, three horns who also do some backup singing and play percussion, bass player who does some backup singing. So I just want main vocal, keys, second main vocal, and click in my monitor and then I use that 57 to bring in the, the rest of the band myself. Um, Frisco, you can't go wrong with staying on the hi-hat more. Yeah, I think, I think this song could potentially be all hi-hat, just different degrees of open and closed. Maybe just the bridge going to the ride or something. It is a kind of a stagnant dynamic tune, except for that one push going into the, to the bridge. All right, so anyway, these drums are tuned super duper low. So before I was saying I carry a mic in my mixer box and we'll set up behind my head. Yeah. Yeah, usually the stages in the rooms I'm playing these days, I am back as far as I can get. <laughs> Either at the very edge of the stage, if it's like a metal riser, or I'm pretty much back against the wall, which is why I tend to hide it on the ground. But yeah, that would be probably like right here, right, would be the best spot for it. Um, all right, where are these drums tuned currently? That is a beefy 59 hertz, which is B flat first octave. Eighty three hertz, that is E second octave. That must have gone down a bit because I think I had it at F yesterday. So I'm gonna just try to bring it up the batter head a smidgen. Let's see what if it if it sounds better or worse. which this would put the batter head higher than the bottom head on the floor tom. I've got these tackle bags that, that are, they hook onto the tension rods, which is cool, but it makes it hard to tune. So I'm gonna take those off first. All right. So just a little bit higher on the batter side of this floor tom, see what we get. Now that's at C, which is normally where I have a 16 inch floor tom. Which is 65, roughly 65 hertz. 
that sound just immediately once I put a little bit of extra, that little bit of tension, the drum kind of opened up to me in my ears. But now the sustain might be a problem if there's a mic on it, but we only have one overhead mic, so it's not really an issue. Now that's a G, second octave, which is 92 hertz, or 98 hertz. I dig it, but I think maybe I should have gone for the F. I'm gonna try bringing this rack tom down to the F so we'll have a perfect fourth instead of a fifth. I'm hearing some like pitch bend and stuff that I'm not really a fan of, um, which means I probably would would have to address the bottom head to kind of even it out. But that is an F-ish, so now it should be a perfect fourth. So I've got a dilemma. I'm not loving the rack tom there. I think it might need to go up a half step. F sharp. That sounds a lot more smoother and natural for this drum, which means the relationship between the top and the bottom are a spot that's happy. If I really wanted to get it down to an F, I probably would have to take the bottom head down like an eighth of a turn and the top together to bring the whole drum down because I'm liking this sound, but it's an F sharp. So I've got a tritone between the toms, which is, can be cool, but. I'm gonna try forcing this guy up to the C sharp now.
Yeah, so this 16 is, has a little bit more versatility at these lower tunings. It's on the verge of, of getting out of balance to where the, the bottom head and the top head are too far spread apart. It's starting to get kind of a little unclear. But I think that still sounds pretty freaking cool. So that's C sharp. I'm liking it. That's probably where I would leave this kit and then adjust for the room or the session or whatever. I do, um, oftentimes, if I have the time and the production requires it, I will tune the, the drums to match the song. As long as it's not a song that changes keys a million times. I usually go for the root or the fifth, sometimes the fourth, sometimes the third, depending on what key it is and um, you know, what kind of chords are being played and what drum I'm using. Interestingly, this is also an F sharp. So we're kind of in the key of either F sharp or C sharp now. Kick drum. Kick drum is sitting at an E, it looks like. So if I wanted to get that to an F sharp, I usually just tune the, the two tension rods closest to me and then the two top tension rods on the front. That's Once I get a, the bass drum sounding good to start, if I have to make wholesale pitch adjustments, I really only change these four unless, unless it needs to be an extreme change. So I'm just gonna do some batter head adjustments on these two and then those two to see if I can bring it up a step. Shouldn't be too hard. All right, that's an F and all I did was change the batter side. So I bet if I go Quarter turn on these. That's a sharp F, so go another quarter turn on those. I think I've gone like a half turn on all four of these rods. Close, we're a flat F sharp now, so I'll just do another little adjustment here. Right on the money, 46 hertz, F sharp, first octave. Now the whole kit is in the key of F sharp. So I did a fairly, <laughs> I mean, it was almost a full turn on these four rods on the bass drum. So it's really out of balance now, you know, within each head is not, obviously not perfectly in tune. Drum still sounds great. Adding that extra tension did bring out some boom. So I've got a little bit more boom to the sound without losing all the, the punch. Still sounds basically like it did before I tuned it. It's just got a little bit more um, woof to it. And thanks to the single ply coated head, it's 
still getting that real defined smack of the beater. I said it yesterday, I think I'm converting to single ply coated bass drum heads. Reconverting, it's what I used to use when I played mostly jazz, but for the past decade or so I've been doing, if I had my choice, the EQ4 frosted, Evans EQ4 frosted, which is a single ply head with the muffling ring and a light coating. Or the Remo equivalent would be the Renaissance um, Power Stroke 3. That's like my go-to punchy modern bass drum head. You kind of have to work a little bit more doing a single ply coated like this, but you can't get this sound from any other head. You just can't. That that mid-range attack, which is really, it's not, it's not just all high-end click and then subby bass. There's like mid-range in there. You literally cannot get that from any any pre-muffled head or two-ply head. It's a single ply coated. That's the sound. Um, Jeff Picaro. Yogi Horton, <laughs> I mean, Jim Keltner, uh, all my favorite players. That's the sound, the bass drum sound, single ply coated. I think if you want the most character out of your bass drum, that's the only way to get it. If you just need something that's a click and a punch, then put one of those pre-muffled heads on it. It'll get you there. This, you'd have to you'd have to kind of fight it a little bit more, maybe put a little bit more dampening in it. Um, right now, I just have um, two of those Remo muffle tube things, the like the tube sausage pillows. And then I also put a bath towel in the middle, in between those, so one of those those sausages is hitting the batter head and one's hitting the front head and then I put a bath towel laid flat in between them just to break up some some reflections. It's pretty controlled but it also there's there's overtone there's there's funk you can hear it through the lavalier but when you lay into it and you start playing in context context it's it's the sound. I love it. I urge everyone to try it. Single ply coated bass drum head if you want the most character out of your bass drum. Whether you tune high or low, that's going to be the most character you can get out of your drum. Um, all right, I thought I was going to spend a lot more time tuning, but that this kit sounds good. I don't want to mess with it. Um, there's no questions for any of you hanging out in the chat. Appreciate you all logging in a little bit later. I'm trying to be consistent, but I've got multiple jobs to do, so I can only get on here when I can get on here. I'm very fortunate that my office is literally right over there behind this light. So when I get an hour break, I can just come over here and hop on. Uh, what do you think? These drums sound cool? They look pretty cool under these lights. I'm not usually a brass hardware fan, but this distressed relic hardware, pretty freaking cool, if you ask me. So these are Single flange, solid brass hoops with clips on the toms. Solid brass tube lugs that had the, the chrome plating stripped off, so it's just raw brass. They're all raw brass. Um, poplar mahogany shells with ash on the outside that Chris over Bucks County distressed strategically by taking it out into the parking lot and scratching it up on the gravel. So it's got that relic purposefully aged look, which is super cool. It's got leather badges, which I really dig. Yeah, matching wood hoops. This is the Jatoba. 
Um, you can kind of see it. Yeah, this is the Jatoba snare I've been using in here for a while. Kind of looks like the old WFL Pioneer thing that I have. So it kind of fits. I have a, I'm going to use my signature drum with this kit probably next time. Um, how much of the sound is due to those hoops? I've had this conversation with Chris often about it because he loves these kind of hoops, these old school hoops. Um, they don't, they, they allow the drum to open up very naturally. So, which can be good or bad. He had put these similar hoops on the big solid mahogany kit that's in the other studio. Big thick shells, real heavy. Um, those shells had too much sound and putting these thinner, lighter hoops on it, it didn't contain it enough. So it was kind of like throwing overtones all throughout the room and I couldn't get enough of a focused tone out of them. So they just didn't work on it. They looked great, but didn't work on it. So I had to put 3.0s actually on that kit to really kind of tighten it up. With these thinner shells with mahogany and poplar, softer woods, these hoops are great for letting the shell kind of resonate to its fullest potential. These would be pretty dry, punchy drums if I put thicker hoops on it. So it's just a, at least in my experience with Chris's drums, it's a, str it's a strategic choice between how much do you need to control the shell's vibration versus the opposite, how much do you want the shell to just open up and resonate. So this is a good match. Softer, darker sounding shells, lighter hoops. I mean, they have a nice sustain, but it doesn't go on forever. The note is pretty pure and focused on those thick uh, mahogany drums. That would just be like, it would just be, it would have sounded explosive. It'd be like just so much sound that you couldn't get a very definitive note. I also think um, lower tunings. These are these these types of hoops can really. I mean, you put any. If I put in too much tension on this thing, first of all, these clips will break. So if you like really high tuning, if if this was a bop kit and I was going for Max Roach or something, now nah, these hoops would be a no go. I probably would have to go at least with uh, 1.6 triple flange. So lower tunings also is important. Um, do I have any of those on the snare drum? I do on my oak, but it's not, it's not these thinner hoops. It's actually the thicker 3.0 no flange hoops, I believe. I'll have to bring that drum in next time that I can tune higher. But these thin solid brass ones, I don't think I can go much higher than this. I mean, it can, but I, I can feel the clips like really kind of biting down on the hoop. So it's starting to kind of lose its focus. doing pretty good but yeah it's I, I wouldn't trust these under a ton of tension like this oh, okay yeah a Gretsch snare with clips is that original with clips or, or you'd put it on clips on it did they ever come with clips <laughs> but yeah if I have a drum with clips it, it's not gonna be a high tuned drum let's see if I can get this guy back to where it's supposed to be I 
it still sounds pretty freaking good to me though. Now, if I'm tuning really high, my favorite hoop is the solid brass 2.3s, either chrome over brass or raw brass or nickel over brass. Those things sing, and they're built like tanks. Okay, early 50s three-ply had clips on it. All right. Huh, I have to look up some old Gretsch drums. I'm not. A, I'm definitely not super up on Gretsch history. For whatever reason, I've been way more of a Ludwig Slingerman, and lately Rogers. back. I think it's back to an F sharp. No. But what I was saying is for the really high tunings, those solid brass triple flange are, I mean, they're expensive, but those suckers sing. I have them on my Six and a half by 14 um, black nickel over brass, Masters of Maple Black Ugly Snare. Kills, kills. Sounds better than any actual Black Beauty I've ever played. And I think it's because those hoops, those solid brass hoops, they just sing. I think they're 2.3s, maybe 2.5s. But they rip. By the way, I, when I ordered this kit, this relic kit, I told Chris Carr, who makes all the shells and drums himself, I said, I need you to make me a kit that will make me put my vintage Ludwig drums away in storage. Because for so, much, so many sessions, I was pulling out the old 60s um, Ludwigs. It's just the sound, fat, punchy, has some vibe, but not too much vibe. Controlled microphones, love it. So I said, I want you to build me a new kit that will be the Ludwig killer. And that's what this is. This is my Ludwig killer. And now that I think I found the ideal bass drum head for this sucker, it's going to go back in the studio ASAP. Um, it had it had a um, EQ3, which is a two ply head with a muffling ring. It just wasn't vibing. It just had no character. It was just all snap, like rubbery snap, and like low end hum. Not even like good low end. It was just like a it wasn't bringing out the maximum potential of this drum. This does single ply code. 
What's up, Alex? Thanks for logging in. Yeah, this kit's pretty sweet. All my vintage drums are now in storage. Once I got this, um, they all went in cases and they are in storage. There's only one vintage, there's two vintage kits still out in my studio because they're just special for a certain thing. I have a 65 um, Slingerland Gene Krupa set up, 13, 16, 22 with a solid maple snare, blue sparkle. Um, I'm pretty sure that's the same, the same setup that John Bonham used on Led Zeppelin 1. And it is that sound. Like if I need that sound, Led Zeppelin, early Led Zeppelin, nothing else touches it. And also I can take the front head off and pad it up and it sounds like Charlie Watts. So that old 65 kit stays over there for that. And then um, I have a 60, 68 downbeat set up, 12, 14, 20 Ludwig, Black Diamond Pearl, that also does what it does. It does the 60s um, Motown slash like um, soul jazz kind of sound that I can't get that from anything else. So those two kits stay out. Everything else I can get from my, my Bucks kit. This is like primary all-purpose fat kit. Right now I have a Birch kit set over there because I have a, a artist who's doing very nostalgic kind of 80s sounds. So I'm using the Birch kind of recording custom style kit for that. And then the big old monster mahogany poplar 13, 16, 18, 24 is my favorite recording kit for when I need to really hit the drums. And there's some other stuff over there, acrylic kit. That bop kit that was in here is over there. That little tiny micro kit, the orange one, that's over there. Is that everything? That's it. <laughs> Plus a ton of, ton of snares. But this is going back in the studio, the main studio, once I get tired of playing it in this little room. Because I gotta hear, I gotta hear this bass drum now that I think I've found its secret recipe. Um, anyway, thank you all for logging in. I appreciate it as always. You can always reach me on Instagram, Mike Dawson Drums. Hit me up with any questions, comments, complaints, requests. And I will keep logging on here. And I'm going to keep working on some of these Jim Riley tracks. Maybe go to a different genre next. We'll see. I've got this kit in here, so I should probably do all the kind of contemporary pop country tracks first. Um, while I have that, then I'll swap it for some of the different styles. But he does have some double bass tracks, so I've got to get, get my double pedal back out and start shedding some, some metal. Well, that'll be interesting. But anyway, have a good day. Uh, I should be back on tomorrow around noon. So have a good one. See ya.